Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for joining us for what promises to be an exceptional discussion of how climate change and wildfire are affecting winemaking and agriculture in California. My name is Mackenzie Smith. I'm the university librarian and vice provost for digital scholarship here at UC Davis, and I will be your MC this evening. Uh, and on behalf of the library, it's truly an honor to welcome all of you and our former governor to UC Davis. To open the program, we've asked uh, our provost and executive vice chancellor, Ralph Hexter, to come up to the stage and just offer a few words of welcome. Ralph? Thank you, Mackenzie. Good evening and welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you all for this singular event. Before anything else, I want to thank our two distinguished speakers, former Governor of California Jerry Brown and Dr. Anita Oberholster from our Department of Viticulture and Enology, and also everyone in the audience for your participation. We're especially grateful to former Governor Brown for finding time in his schedule, which is now only extremely busy and no longer impossibly busy, for coming to UC Davis to speak with us. This evening is part of a series titled Savor, Lectures on Food and Wine, which is a collaborative effort by our Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science, RMI for short, and the UC Davis Library. The goal of each SAVER event is to prevent, present, not prevent, present an illuminating discovery of some of the biggest topics in food and wine being studied at UC Davis today. The series format of bringing together a UC Davis researcher and an eminent external figure is calculated to shed maximum light on an important topic pertaining to food or wine. Although it's hard for me to think of Governor Brown as external since he's a former regent and of course a UC alumnus. As for the topic we are, will address this evening, it's difficult to imagine three things that are of greater importance to our state than wine and other agricultural products, wildfires and climate change. There are a number of reasons that this event and this SAVER series in general fit so well at UC Davis. We're a world leader in research and innovation, agricultural sciences, food studies, winemaking, water, the environment, and sustainable systems. We have an institutional mission of excellence in education, research, and public service to benefit not only Californians, but also people around the world and the health of our planet. Honoring this mission, we place a high priority on engaging in myriad ways with our surrounding in communities, region and state, as well as nationally and internationally. Of special relevance to this occasion is our long history of collaborations, partnerships and friendships with Central Valley agriculture, including grape growers and winemakers. As the audience well knows, wine business is big business in California. The wine alone is worth $35 billion per year. One more example, across both our Davis and Sacramento campuses, much of our teaching, research, and public service is highly collaborative and brings together multiple disciplines. This approach, we know, is often the best path to understanding complex challenges and creating effective solutions. Our event this evening, which brings together a government leader and a UC Davis scientist and is co-sponsored by the RMI and our university library is but one reflection of our collaborative and multidisciplinary culture. The topic, wine, wildfire, and climate change, promises us a fascinating look at how wildfires and climate change affect our state's wine production. This is of considerable value, even before we take into the account that much of will, oh, oh, excuse me, even before we take into account that much of what will be discussed will be relevant to California agriculture in general. As we all know, California agriculture involves more than producing wine, almonds, dairy products, and tomatoes. The quality of our agricultural products and the ways in which we produce them are closely linked to our state's prosperity, health, environment, ecosystems, quality of life, and history. This evening's discussion will be valuable for what it can add to our way of thinking about the other two subjects in the title, wildfires and climate change. The key to creating an adequate consciousness of both these phenomena, one that recognizes them as urgent societal and planetary challenges requiring effective responses, is to reveal and communicate their destructive effects on discrete slices of real life, like the wine industry. 
this evening, while we are learning about wine, we are also participating in this larger beneficial process of calling attention to the urgency of the climate crisis facing us. Our two speakers will receive formal introductions from others, so on this subject, I will make only one brief observation. I cannot imagine any individuals better positioned through knowledge and experience to illuminate this topic. Like you, I'm eager to hear their presentations. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Andrew Waterhouse. I'm director of the Robert Mondavi Institute. The Institute serves to enhance the public's understanding of food and wine science, and these joint lectures with the UC Davis Library are our premier venue for doing exactly that and engaging the public in a discussion of current ideas and issues of great importance. Our first speaker, Anita Oberholster, arrived in 2011 <clears throat> as our Cooperative Extension Specialist in Enology, that is the science of winemaking, here at UC Davis. CE specialists are faculty members who have research and teach and outreach duties. Her research program is very industry focused, as you might guess, and looks at a wide array of issues on how grape cultivation practices or winemaking practices or environmental factors affect wine quality and the sustainability of winemaking. At UC Davis, we are pushing the boundaries of, in sustainability with our facilities and our research. And I just want to point out one example of Dr. Oberholster's leadership in this area is her research into wastewater recycling. Um, she's shown that it's very feasible to use winery wastewater uh, for vineyard irrigation, even over an extended period, <clears throat> without compromising vineyard soil uh, quality. And in a near desert climate, like we have here in California, um, uh, water recycling is, is, is a great tool. She also pursues solutions for new and unexpected problems uh, for the wine industry as they pop up. One of these is smoke taint, a climate change surprise. We expect fire to be an issue on wild lands, which burn, but not in agricultural fields, which generally don't. But tonight we'll hear how wildfires in nearby, in, in fires in nearby wildlands affect vineyards. Dr. Oberholster's vigorous industry extension programs provides California winemakers with the latest in research information, innovation, provides a forum for industry discussions with events all across California. Because of, that, because of her success, Wine Business Monthly, the industry trade magazine, has named her one of the most influential people in California wine industry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Oberholster. And I was asked to mention that we won't take questions till the end, so hold your questions. <laughs> so if I don't answer, I'm not being rude. I'm just following orders. Um, so I would like to thank the organizers of tonight's event to invite me to speak. Um, I'm passionate about all the research I do, including smoke tain, and you will notice this. So um, let me not forget to change the slides. So what has climate change, wildfires, and wine to do with each other? So like Annie mentioned, I've also done some other work in sustainability, where I looked at the, the use of recycled wastewater for grapevine irrigation. And when I went around the state to present this work, um, the phrase climate change has fallen somewhat out of favor. So I started using the synonym increasing incidences of drought. So now I'm going to change that to increasing incidences of drought and wildfires. So the thing is, in the last five years, we had seven of the 20 most deadliest and the most destructive fires in California's history. More than 600,000 acres burnt. That's 5% of the state. More than 30,000 structures burnt or were destroyed, and more than 130 lives were lost. So now we may think, okay, we get that, right? We get the heartache of losing property, the, the tragedy of losing any kind of lives. So why should we 
be concerned about the impact on the grape and wine industry. Well, the grape and wine industry provides 786,000 jobs in the US. It has annual economic activity of over 114 billion in the US. You have more than 600,000 acres of wine grapes, almost 6,000 wine grape growers, more than 4,600 wineries, and that is only in California. So, you know, this is a significant amount of people we're talking about. So what's the connection between wildfires and smoke tent? Well, most of you, I assume, have heard about smoke tent, especially since the wildfires in 2017, because it impacted some very well-known wine grape growing areas in Napa and Sonoma counties. Even though those weren't the only wine growing counties that were affected, they were the most well-known. Well, let's think about this. So before I talk a little bit about smoke tanks, so here's the science coming in. I am gonna tell you, okay, what's a wine tank? So as a scientist, we see a wine tank as something that coming from outside and overpowers a wine, making it one dimensional, only having one characteristic. Okay, that's seen as a tank. Now in the case of smoke tank, that overpowering characteristic is smoky, burnt, campfire, medicinal, earthy. Okay. And then you also have this lingering retronasal ashtray character at the back of your throat. <laughs> so I will explain that a little bit later. Now people describe this as licking a cold ashtray. Now some of you may have to use your imagination. I grew up with a dad that smoked a pipe. And it would be lying around the house. And obviously a five, six year old think it's really fun to take your dad's pipe and suck on it. Well, so I know exactly what that would taste like. Okay, so use your imagination. So now let's get to the signs. How does it work? So 15 to 25 percent of wood is lignin. So what is lignin? It's the fiber of your food. When you take that carrot and it's crunchy, it's because of the lignin in there. It's what gives wood its structure. Okay, so basically when lignin burns, you have thermal degradation, and it releases a massive amount of compounds that we call volatile phenols. If you look at the structure, the chemist in you, you see that ring structure, all those rings get released, and they're volatile phenols, and they're in the air. Something to remember, we all like oak in our wine, right? We like barrel-aged wine. When we toast a wine barrel, we are doing the same thing, but more on a controlled environment. When you have a lightly toasted, medium toasted, or a highly toasted barrel, you're charring the inside of the barrel and you're getting the same compounds, just at a low level. So at a low level, it adds complexity to your wine. At a high level, like most other things, too, good, too much of a good thing is not a good thing anymore. It really, really overpowers the wine and it causes a taint. So these compounds aren't a health issue. We're only concerned about volatile phenols because of the quality impact it has on grapes and on wines. So there you have a diagram of what a grape berry looks like, okay? I'm not gonna go into too much detail. What I wanna show you, there's an example in green of a typical volatile phenol, glycol. That's what it looks like. So now we know that grapes, when they're on the vine, they're all susceptible to smoke. However, the riper they get, especially after variaison. That's when red grapes start turning red, um, red, they're green before, and you start to see the start of sugar accumulation. They become more susceptible. So what happens is these volatile phenols can absorb through the berry skin. So they're not sitting on the outside, you can't wash them off. And the moment they go in the berry, there's actually enzymes in the grape that can glycosylate them. Basically what that means is it attaches sugar onto these volatile phenols. And now they're not volatile anymore. They're now bound and non-volatile. So now you have this complex picture, right? You have things that are aromatic, it's volatile, you can smell them, and things that aren't aromatic, you can't smell them, they're bound to a range of different sugars. Now when you get your grapes in and you crush the grapes, a certain amount of that gets extracted into your wine or in your fermenting must. And during fermentation, more and more of that will extract from your skin cells. So that's just something to keep in mind. 
Now let's talk a little bit about smoke taint perception because that's very difficult. And I said I'm going to go back to that retronasal ashtray character. Now what happens is researchers have found that we have in our saliva bacterial microorganisms, basically bacterial enzymes. And these enzymes are able to, to free the bound compounds, remove the sugars, and make them volatile. So now you're drinking a wine, and all these bound compounds are getting released due to the enzymes in your saliva, and that's why you get this taste at the back of your throat if you, when you keep the wine in your mouth. So we're all different. None of us have the same saliva. None of us have the same composition. So you get people that can't taste it at all because they don't have this bacteria, and others that can taste it at different sensitivities to this. Okay, so this is a complexity. People talk about odor threshold levels, right? Basically what it means, if I have two wines and 50% of you can pick out the one is different from the other, that's an odor threshold level. But you don't know what's different, something's different. If you can recognize it as smoke, that's the recognition threshold level, okay? And that's even higher. Now, people throw these values around. Most of them have been determined in water. Wine is one of the most complex matrices in the world. Everything influences everything else. So, we know if we have volatile phenols, different combinations of them, some suppress each other, others enhances the effect of smokiness. I can tell you if I have two identical wines here of exactly the same amount of smoke taint marker compounds, and to the one I add a little bit of fruity character, it's going to cover up the smoke. If I add to the other one a little bit of green character, a little bit of green pepper, just throw a green pepper in there, it's going to enhance the smoky character. I'm just trying to give you an idea that how complex this whole issue is, and this is why we're so slow sometimes getting results. So, the Australian grape and wine industry have been severely impacted by fires in the early 2000s. And they responded by really funding and initiating several research projects trying to identify what is smoke taint, what can we do about this problem. As a matter of fact, today, most of what we know is still the work that they've been publishing the last 10 years. So what happened? How did I get into smoke taint research? Well, what happened is, this is my um, experimental trial at Oakville Experimental Station in the Oakville Station at, in Napa. And I was doing a grapevine red blotch um, disease trial, looking at the impact of this disease on grape and wine quality. I was waiting for my grapes to ripen, and then the fires came, and we didn't have access to our vineyards, and we had to wait a week. By the time I got there to harvest my grapes, it was absolutely clear to me that I was not going to study the impact of grapevine red blotch disease on wine quality, but more smoke taint impact on wine quality. So at the end, we harvested everything that was there, and we started a smoke taint project. So this is what we did. So Australians have been giving guidelines. And in 2017, we knew nothing. We used the Australian guidelines. And these guidelines are based on research they've done over several years, 10 to 15 years, but looking at different varieties with different amount of smoke exposures. And also, as the research evolved, the analysis techniques evolved. In the beginning, they measured two marker compounds. Then they increased that to seven to have be better predictability. Then they realized, oh, no, most of these compounds are actually bound. We need to analyze the glycosides as well. So it's been changing the whole time. And they're doing re guidelines or recommendations based on this body of work which you can't really compare directly with each other. Now, the one recommendation they do, that's the first row, the first column is using fruity yeast to cover up the smokiness in the wine. So we did a yeast trial. Then they said, okay, oak additives. If you do lightly toasted oak additives, it adds complexity. You don't even know the smoke is there. So we did an oak additive trial. Then they said, limit the skin contact so that as little as possible of these compounds extract. So we did a skin contact trial. And then they said, using more cooler fermentation temperatures to extract less of these compounds. So we did that as well. So what we did is we have all these wines and we analyzed them by analytical methodology as well as by descriptive sensory analysis. Basically, this is where you have a trained panel. They develop 
descriptives for these wines, and they see whether they can distinguish among these wines using specific attributes. So this not only tells you if a wine is different from each other, it also tells you how they are different from each other. So don't get intimidated. I was set to show you a little bit of data, just to show that I'm actually doing something. So, so you look at the left, you'll see there's this big circle and it says unsmoked one, unsmoked two. So because I actually had a research trial there looking at disease impact, I actually do have a control because the week before the fires, I did harvest some fruit. So I actually have a control. So now you can see that, yes, there's a difference. There's all my treated wines and there's my control. Next one, I just removed that so you can only see the trials. Don't worry if you don't know what's what. Basically, if you see on the left, you see BDX and BDX. That's one yeast. That yeast was quite successful in hiding it on the nose, right? And even retronasally a little bit. But the rest, you can see, they're all pretty much the same. It didn't have a huge impact. So one yeast shows some potential. Then we had a second panel, because we had too many wines, we had to divide them in two. And the second panel looked at different fermentation temperatures and different skin contact time. And here you can see, okay, they all look the same. On the left is all the fermentation temperatures, really no impact. On the right, you'll see my unsmoked control and the, those treatments, they're all in the same. Unfortunately, it does not mean that those on the right weren't, weren't evaluated as smoking. I was impacted twice by the fires. So my grapes were impacted, and these panels ran in fall of 2018. So we had fires and the university closed for two weeks due to air quality. The problem is most of our panel members are students. And so I had a week to finish the forming analysis before final started and everybody goes on vacation. So, we did extra holding times, waiting times between wines, crackers, waters, whatever you can do. At the end, there's a lot of carryover. If you do, and that's why my unsmoked was rated lightly as smoky. I see it all the time when I do industry tastings. We always hide controls in the setup. Basically, what you get is there's a lot of carry, carryover. After the, your third smoky wine, everything tastes smoking. It's another complex factor. My students really don't like this. So basically what we found is volatile phenols extract really quickly. And yes, using some oak additives, using some yeast, it can cover it up slightly. But what we know now is during wine aging, those characters really diminishes and the smoke just come back up. So it's really not a long-term solution. And nothing else seemed to make a difference. If you want to make a rosé with a lightly impacted smoke and um, impacted grapes, you could do that. But something like grapes from Napa Valley. If you know how much those grapes are worth, there's no way you can make a rosé and make money from it. You need to make a full blow, full bloody, uh, bodied, sorry, <laughs> full bodied <laughs> Napa cap to really get a return on your investment, uh, which is the grapes. So. Now we say, rather make the best quality wine that you can make, and let's look at emulation techniques. There's several companies out there that say that they can try, treat your smoke-impacted wines and fix them. And this is what I'm currently doing. I'm collaborating with companies. They're fixing or treating wines that we've made under controlled conditions, have different level of smoke-impacted, and we are evaluating objectively are these techniques working? What can they do for you so that we can give some guidelines to winemakers? So this is probably the, the question I get the most often. How to determine smoke taint risk? Well, that's really the million dollar question. It's really difficult to answer. So currently, we have different laboratories doing testing for smoke taint to determine smoke taint risk. And they're all using different methods. Industry entities are all using different criteria to evaluate what they see as risk. So if you're an insurance company or your grape grower or your winery. So what we really need to do is develop guidelines. So the first thing I want to say is just because you see smoke, it doesn't mean you're going to have smoke impacted wines from that vineyard. What you see is ash in the air, okay? Volatile phenols are real small, you can't see them. And we have some 
anecdotal data that indicates that they do have a half-life. They do break down and then you just have smoke. No volatile phenols. So in South Australia, they had very bad fires and they had a wind that blew all the smoke away from the vineyards to the ocean. 24 hours later, there's this column of smoke that blew right back into McLaren Vale. And they all thought they're gonna have smoke taint and they couldn't find anything. So this is where we get the idea, and we're working with atmospheric scientists to try and figure out what's the half-life of these compounds. The thing is for us to really help guide growers and winemakers is we need baseline data. Volatile phenols are naturally, I told you it's an oak, but it's naturally present in grapes as well. And we know different varieties have different natural amounts of these compounds. So this makes it even more difficult. A grape grower sends me his data and says, do I have a problem or not? I have no idea what his baseline is because he didn't analyze his grapes and paid hundreds of dollars to analyze grapes that wasn't impacted. He only analyzed it when he had a problem. So what's the baseline? Now the Australians spent a lot of money and time for their top 12 varieties that did over 500 tests for non-smoke impacted grapes and wines and got baseline. And when they analyze data, you see that graph there with the gray bars. The gray bars are for that specific variety, grape variety, for that compound, what's the natural range for that variety. And then they put that little dot, is that person's sample fitted right into that natural range. So if you get that result, you go, I'm pretty safe. But if your samples come back as elevated or above the gray bars, you have a risk. And the more elevated it is, the higher your risk is. And that's what we want to do here. At this point in time, I can tell a grower when there's no risk because it's very, very low levels. Or, you know, I get some data that the levels are so high, it's pretty much a no-brainer. It's the minimal to moderate risk that we really don't know. And we need to create this baseline data. I am talking with researchers on the West Coast, Oregon State, Washington State University, and we are applying for funding to do research. I'm also, we're also working with the Wine Institute, with the California Association of Wine Grape Growers, to try and get federal funding so that we can do baseline data for us. We don't know how the US relates to the, to the Australian data. We really would like to know. In the meantime, I am working with um, like, um, with um, grape commissions from specific counties that's really worried, were really highly impacted, just doing on a lower budget, a little bit slower process, and for their main varieties and see if we can develop some baseline data for them this year. Well, fingers crossed, we don't have any smoke exposure because for da baseline data, obviously, I need non-exposed, smoke-exposed grapes. So that's my story. So this is a photo that was taken uh, when we went to harvest our grapes, those are two of my students, Raul Garadello and Aaron Rambau. They were actually supposed to work on grapevine red blotch disease. And they still did that research too. But they chipped in and said, Anita, we know you're busy. We'll help. We'll make these wines with you. So they've been real stars. Um, and obviously, it's not like I have no money. We always need more. But... <laughs> I've received money from the American Vineyard Foundation, Dan and Ron Muller Terrible Fund, um, Lions and Narrows Family Research Fund, Napa Valley Witness, Wine Business Monthly, Rossi Funds. I mean, we're so grateful for any money we get because it enables us to do what we do best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. We're off to a good start. Fires have taken thousands of homes, killing people, changing the nature of the forest, releasing even more greenhouse gases, taxing our local firefighting services. It's a reality, and it's just beginning. It's getting worse and will continue to get worse. We've got enough indicators. What we have to do now is put this all together in debate and public discourse such that we can build the political will to take the hard steps to transform and decarbonize our whole economy. Those are not my words. Those are the words of our next speaker. From the earliest days of his career, Jerry Brown has made the environment a cornerstone of his agenda. In his first year as governor of California, back in 1975, he worked with the state's legislature to roll back a tax break for oil companies. Uh, he was a pioneer in pursuing the nation's first energy efficiency standards for buildings and appliances. He worked to address smog and air pollution and to stop offshore oil drilling. 
1977, he signed the first ever tax incentive for rooftop solar. As we sit here in 2019 on a campus that's consistently ranked among the most sustainable in the nation, where every new building is designed to meet LEED certification standards, it's hard to imagine the vision that required. Yet the impact of that vision surrounds us every day. Over the last eight years, under Governor Brown's leadership, California has taken a strong stand in the fight against climate change. Brown helped lead the alliance of states and cities that agreed to uphold the Paris Accord when the federal government would not. He set a target for the state to get five million electric cars on the road by 2030 and sued to stop the federal government from weakening auto emission standards. In his last months in office, he hosted governors, mayors, and business leaders from around the world at a global climate action summit and signed a law setting California on a path to generate 100% of its electricity from carbon-free sources by 2045. It's hard to think of a leader who has had a more clear-eyed and articulate stance on the subject of climate change or has done more in his career to stop it. When other leaders shied away from the conversation or refused to act, Jerry Brown called her attention again and again to the threats of drought, wildfire, sea level rise, and the science that clearly connects them that we are changing the climate. Again and again, he's led California to action and forged a path for other states to follow. We're very honored to have him here to speak with us tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming former governor of the state of California, Jerry Brown. Well, thank you very much. Um, I won't have any slides, <laughs> so you don't have to worry. And um, I don't have as much data as we probably need, uh, and it won't be quite as uh, complex. Uh, but that's the whole story of climate change, that we have to understand it at the micro level and at the macro level. The impacts are right here, locally, uh, in winemaking, in wine tasting, in all manner of activity that is centered here at uh, UC Davis. But the solution is located here in small part, but in large part is everywhere. So we have a local problem, but we need a global solution. There are local efforts that you can make, but unless those efforts are replicated uh, throughout the entire world. Unless uh, Washington and the current government makes a change or is somehow gotten rid of, <laughs> and unless, uh, uh, unless the uh, new president in India uh, gets some added incentive, because that's a really big country, and today I noticed there uh, some of the temperatures in Rajasthan were at uh, 50 degrees uh, Celsius. It's getting hot, and that's wet heat. You know, it's not like this nice dry stuff we have here. And then unless Russia, and unless Germany, and England, and Brazil, and all, China, and they're doing a lot, but they're still increasing their emissions. They're still building new coal plants. In fact, I was in uh, Russia and, the, and Vladivostok at an economic conference, and uh, there, well, it wasn't China, but it was uh, Putin, was the president of South Korea, uh, president of uh, Japan, prime minister of Japan, and then the president of Mongolia. And they talked about trade, and they waxed eloquent about LNG facilities and pipelines, and all that would do for their people. There wasn't a word, not a syllable, about climate change. And I think that's very characteristic about the uh, decision-making throughout the world. So... What we have here is uh, changes that are going to result and require what you just heard in the previous lecture, and that is just to deal with tasting wine. We're going to have to, we, I'm not going to do it, but she is, and she's going to have to get a lot of money. I mean, how much money are we going to spend till we don't have to worry about smoke taint in our California wine or Australian wine? It's going to tell us a lot of money, millions, tens of millions, a lot. And that's only one tiny little part of the climate change problem. And just think of that little lecture, multiply it a billion times about all the other activities 
in nature and uh, with respect to human beings. And that's all that we're going to have to do because we have to first figure out how to understand climate change, figure out how to uh, prevent it, how to extract, get to zero emissions. Then we have to extract another gigaton, uh, another trillion gigatons of uh, car uh, carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, boy, that's a lot. And that is what is on, on the chopping block for getting done. So the business of wine is very important. I am a wine drinker, and I don't like smoke in my wine. <laughs> Burgundy, Chardonnay, are you? I don't bother with that rosé stuff. So, <laughs> so it's a problem, but there's a lot of other issues. So uh, I did bring an article from Nature. I figure if I'm in an academic environment, or at least in a library, I got to have a citation. <laughs> and this is from Nature. Uh, let's see, it was... Um, it was December 2018, volume 564, page 30. Uh, what this tells you, you can probably see it. Global warming will happen faster than we think. Now, who's the we? The we is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We are the experts who are writing about climate change uh, most of the time. And what these professors are saying, uh, are saying is they're underestimating the acceleration of uh, climate change. And when you get into, and by the way, the effect of that, remember Paris was about two to keep the temperature from rising no more than two degrees centigrade from the time of the Industrial Revolution. Well, there's another little sub-goal. If, if you can, keep it to 1.5. Okay, that was the thought. And the background assumptions are we have till 2040 before we get to 1.5 and much longer before we get to 2.0. What this article is saying, no, uh, it is quite conceivable. Again, we can't, we're not talking absolutes, we're talking probabilities, but uh, it's certainly within the range of the possible that 1.5 degree centigrade increase will be reached by 2030. Now, if you take from where at one degree centigrade and you get to 1.5 in the next 11 years, that's a 50% increase. That's pretty serious. Now, what will it mean? Well, according to this article, it means that 1.5 billion people will be subjected to deadly heat extremes. Hundreds of millions of individuals will be subjected to vector-borne diseases, such as malaria, uh, uh, among others. So that's going to happen quite possibly in the next 10 or 11 years. And it's not going to happen on off. You know, we're at one point, we're at one point at degrees, one degree, and now we're going to 1.5. It's gradually, it's happening. But then, of course, the trajectory is not necessarily on a nice even uh, increase. It can be subject to some major jump that people don't think about. Uh, that's the kind of uh, jumps and unexpected outcomes that climate change uh, threatens. Now, when I, we think about tasting smoke in your wine, that was pretty complex. But climate change is millions of times more complex than that. And, but we have to figure it out. Because this is not about shifting from wine to beer. <laughs> this is about human existence. And not just everybody dies. No, we have a few little preliminaries, like... Uh, massive decline in food production, forcing millions of food migrants moving into Europe, moving into the United States. And if you think we got a problem on the border today, whether it's in Germany or Hungary or in San Diego, uh, it, the outcome with uh, massive movement uh, because of the uh, decline, because of the heat, because of the extreme events, the flooding, the diseases, the, all the rest of it. So we're going to get a social breakdown. In fact, we may even be uh, experiencing some of the early uh, indicators of social breakdown. I mean, look who's leading a lot of the countries in the world today. Uh, these aren't your old-fashioned Democrats. Uh, no, these are hardcore, strong men, I, mostly strong men. I don't know if there's any strong women in that crowd. But this is not a democratic moment. Uh, in fact, the ability of free people to resolve things is weakening 
because of the fear and the dislocations that have already happened at one degree centigrade above the industrial period. So we're looking at social disruption along with uh, environmental uh, disruption, human health disruptions. So that's just this one. Global warming will happen faster than we think. Now, the, uh, the emissions are still rising. We know that. They rose last year in, um, uh, in the United States. Uh, they rose in many, 4%, uh, I think, in China last year. So the emissions are rising. And we have another paradoxical problem, which kind of reminds you of the complexity. Uh, more than anyone even expected, uh, pollutants, sulfates, uh, are being taken out of the air. So that's a good thing. We're getting pollutants out of the environment. The problem is that those air pollutants, while they're bad for our lungs, they do um, prevent uh, heat from reaching the earth. So they're a coolant factor. And the fact that we're cleaning up quicker means that the uh, emissions, the heat, is growing faster. So that's another problem. Third, problem. third factor is that we may be entering a period of natural uh, climate warming. When they look, the oceans are not absorbing as much of the heat, there are certain changes in the way the Pacific and Atlantic are functioning. So that's another reason why acceleration is going to take place in the next couple of decades. So all that says is that we have to redouble our efforts. And in that respect, there is now more discussion, more focus, more research, uh, more activity uh, to deal with climate change, to understand it, uh, to combat it uh, through measures to reduce carbon emissions, uh, but also uh, to find ways to adapt. Because we can't just um, seek to prevent the increase in emissions. We have to start adapting. So we have to spend a lot of money on that. Adapting what? Well, I just uh, not too long ago, some uh, the mayor of San Francisco released a report that will cost $5 billion just to fix the uh, piers, uh, the seawall, uh, in, in one part of San Francisco, not the whole part. So you're going to find the coasts eroding. Uh, you're going to find the weather temperatures like the fires, as we were told that we've had, what is it, seven of the worst fires, forest fires, uh, and it's, it's getting worse. The fire season is longer. The fires are more unpredictable. The fire in Reading had a tornado effect that no one had ever seen before. So we're entering this unpredictable period that we know is not good. Even while we're there, we have our president who says it's a Chinese hoax. <laughs> Actually, I think he took back the Chinese part. It, <laughs> he said now it's just a hoax. But you have a lot of business people and a lot of conservatives who buy that. So I see the problem as not as Trump. The problem is all the people who believe in Trump, and that's a lot of people. We're not, we're not talking a few million. We're talking ten, many tens of, of millions. And we have to somehow uh, wake up uh, our own communities, wake up the world, and do what we have to do. So uh, with, in addition to the specifics, it's going to take a shift in thinking, a shift in awareness. It's going to take a transformation, and this is not just a technological challenge. It's that, for sure. Uh, it's a scientific challenge. But it's also a human challenge. I mean, how many can we take our current pattern and move it 10, 20, 30 years into the future? Now, what's our current pattern? Well, when I was governor the first time, there were 300 million cars in the world. Now there's a billion. At the rate we're going, there'll be a second billion pretty soon. Uh, in California, uh, we have 30 million vehicles, more or less, and uh, they travel 345 billion miles every year, most of it by uh, oil and gas, fossil fuels, plenty of emissions. So we can't think we're going to have 50 million people doing the same thing. So the future cannot be the same. It's going to have to be different. And that difference will be created by technology, by scientific breakthroughs, but also by people being able to change the way they live. A lot of younger people are buying fewer cars. They're living closer where they work. They're using bicycles, walking. So there's a transformation. And these have to go hand in hand. The investment, the uh, techno technological breakthroughs, the introduction of the technologies into the 
into the society, into all the countries of the world, but we're going to have to change. We can't keep going in the way that we are now. And transformations are not easy. They don't come. Usually, uh, a friend of mine told me he, he smoked all his life and he could never stop until he got a heart attack. That, then he stopped. Well, the question is, what kind of a heart attack will it take us, uh, as a metaphor, what's it going to take to, to make the shift? Because we're not making the shift. We're in accelerating, moving in the wrong direction. Even though, if you look at the awareness level about climate change, it's greater now than ever before. And it's getting greater all the time. But it's still uh, not, not as big as it should be. As I like to say, um, not just climate change, but nuclear destruction, that's not news. The end of the world is not news. A Trump tweet is major news. Now, there's something wrong with that picture here. We have to be able to grasp and cope with serious ideas. Now, uh, let me just run by a few concrete things we can do. First of all, we got to get, uh, in California, 40%, and some people say more than that if you add a whole life cycle cost from where the cars come from, the trucks, um, 40 to 50% of our emissions come from uh, transportation car travel. So we've got to get to zero emission vehicles. Now, we do have a goal of 5 million. Um, that's not enough. I just checked today. Uh, California has about 600,000 zero emission vehicles on the road. 600,000. That's 50% of, of the zero emission vehicles in America. So we're doing good, but we're not doing good enough, and the rest are really doing bad. <laughs> so uh, what is that? It's not a pat on the back. That's got to be a challenge. Now, the good news is that that's not really good. It's moderately pleasant news. Um, <laughs> the new car purchases, 10%, 10% at this current rate. It could change any month. But about 10% are zero emission vehicles. That's good. A couple of years ago, it was 2%. So that's good. But we got to get, we got 30 million on the road, and we go, uh, what did I say, 300 and 340, I think it's, no, it's four, 400, I think it's 445 billion. Whatever it is, it's a lot further than going to the sun. But it's getting us to sun-like outcomes if we can't get to zero emission. And it's going to take money. It takes incentives. California, you know, pays people to, it gives them a subsidy. And we got to get not just all the Californians, we got to get the billion cars in the world shifted. And we got to do it in the lifetimes of people in this room. Not my, I don't think I'll be around for that, but many of you people will be. We got to make the shift. So that's to get to zero emission vehicles, and we don't have the policies yet to get there, nor do other countries. I think the only country is Norway that is, go, uh, that is 40 or 50 percent of the new cars are zero emission. Now, the next thing we have to do um, is we got to have energy efficiency. So our appliances and our homes. Uh, we have to get them more and more efficient. California started pioneering that way back in the 70s. And we got our first uh, building standards for efficient houses, and then we got our first appliance standards. Interestingly, that happened just as I was leaving office, and Ronald Reagan was coming in in Washington. He was elected in 1980. And under the Reagan administration, the federal government adopted a nationwide appliance standard that preempted California. You know what the standard was? It was a zero emission, no, it was a zero standard. It was a no standard standard. It wasn't no emissions, it was no standards. And he actually adopted that. That was the federal government preempting California. You can't have efficient refrigerators. Now, after a few years, that they gave up on that and we got to have some standards. The federal government adopted some standards. Then we had the building standards. They've been increased and tightened uh, every decade. But the rest of the country has to do that. And the rest of the world's got to do that. So the, this issue is we got to do a lot. Davis has to do a lot. California, but the world. And if you look at the world leaders, they're talking about a lot of stuff. But they don't talk much about climate change. And if you look at the Paris Agreement, what people said they're going to do, uh, they're not doing it yet. And even if they do what they said they were going to do, it's not enough. So this is a, uh, a problem that is well worth working on. And you may have to resort to a lot of wine drinking to handle it. 
<laughs> hopefully without smoke taint. The next thing we need to, um, uh, well, we have the uh, low, something called the low carbon fuel standard. Low carbon fuel standard I know is good because the oil companies hate it. <laughs> I had uh, three high level Chevron officials come to my office uh, and argue with uh, my staff on two separate occasions for a total of about four hours. And they say they can't meet this low carbon fuel standard. I won't get into the complexity of it, but what the point is we required in California 10% uh, of the fuel meet a criteria called low carbon. So we're reducing the carbon content. And if the oil companies uh, or other companies that are affected by this don't comply, they have to pay. So they, who do they pay? They pay their competitors who are in the biofuel or electrical uh, renewable electricity business. So it's a subsidy from one part of the, the dying fossil fuel industry over to the emerging renewable industry. So it's very, uh, very powerful. And it's so powerful, of course, that it was killed in Washington. Uh, and it's only been adopted in Oregon is the only other place. Uh, then we, the next thing we have is uh, cap and trade. Cap and trade has raised billions of dollars. And it basically says there is a cap on major industrial emissions, and each year the cap goes down. And unless you can meet that, you got to pay, and you have to buy credits. And then the credits go to the state, and the state spends the money, hopefully on good climate, um, climate action projects. And in fact, in agriculture, uh, the commitment was about $250 million a year. And I think there are people at this university that are getting some of that. The next thing we need and we have the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And that, uh, we say, by 2030, we want 60% of our electricity to be renewable. And we're not counting hydro, we're not counting nuclear, uh, even though they are zero emission. So uh, right now, uh, San Diego uh, utility is about 45%. I think in generally in California, we're over 30. Just a few years ago, the utilities uh, and I spoke to key uh, PG&E in Southern California Edison. They said they couldn't make 20% by 2020. That was the standard a few years ago. And now they're way beyond that. So the uh, optimistic part of this is that technology has done more than we thought it could do. And there's no telling what is possible if, A, we get the problem, we see the magnitude, the seriousness, and then we have the political will. The we is the world, the leaders, really get at it. And uh, the renewable port st uh, portfolio standard is crucial. But now you might say, how much of, a, how much of emissions come from electrical companies, electrical consumption? It's only about 16% now. So we got to take care of all the other stuff. I mean, pretty soon cows will emit more carbon than cars. <laughs> or not cars, but uh, electrical companies. The cars are still the big one. Um, and finally, uh, to give ourselves some breathing room, we need to cut the short-term pollutants. That's methane, that's black carbon or soot, and that's uh, hydrofluorocarbons. Those are more intense um, heat-trapping gases, but they don't last that long. So you can, if we can reduce that, uh, we might we get a few more years in which we can reduce the CO2. Uh, that's the major heat-trapping gas. So. Uh, one more, one more point. Uh, California didn't wait for the federal government. We joined with Baden-Wattenberg and over 200 states and regions to form what we call the Under Two MOU. That was to pledge in our respective states and provinces to adopt policies to meet the Under Two uh, standard that was set in the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, Under Two is not enough. We need to get to 1.5. And we're not getting close to being under two, but at least we have uh, over 200 regions that are committed, uh, and they represent about a third of the world's uh, gross domestic product. And that, uh, that's happening. So um, all I can say is if, if you're concerned about this, your concern is justified, but we have to take that concern and turn it into policy, turn it into science, turn it into technological innovation, turn it into adaptation and adopting things that will be uh, more amenable with human survival and human thriving. That's the big issue. And there's a lot of issues that you hear on campus. You can hear a lot of issues in this presidential campaign. But 
if they're not talking seriously about climate change, they're talking trivia. Not trivia, there's a lot of important stuff. But if the climate continues to degrade at the pace that it is, all the other problems, however serious they are, are going to get worse. They're going to be exa uh, exacerbated. So those are the stakes, and I'm very happy to come here and hopefully make you feel uncomfortable, <laughs> but not discouraged, renewed, and uh, zestful in your determination not to let them get away with it, but to make the transformation to make us a sustainable human civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Brown. That was very unsettling. <laughs> but I think many of us agree with you, and we want to talk about what we should do. So now we have about uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions for our speakers, uh, and I'll moderate that. And you know, I always have a lot of questions, but um, I think we have a couple of microphones in the room. OK, we have our first question up front. So the uh, couple of people who have them, the, I, I, you can't see, but there's a question right in front of the pillar here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, Governor, how do you feel about the Green New Deal? See, we have a politician in the audience. Um, well, I would like the Green New Deal to stick to the green because just getting to the climate goals is huge. It's really a revolution uh, that is required. And, uh, the, uh, and I don't want to put down free college admission or those other health care options. Those are really good and important. But I want to focus, number one, on getting at climate reduction. Now, they set certain goals that I think are highly ambitious. But if everybody pulled together on the, on the uh, climate aspect of it, I think we could get close. And we ought to do that. You need, they've set a goal for 2030 that is a lot of people think we couldn't get there. But we're so far in the other direction that I think it would be very good uh, to you know, make those kind of commitments. But I would, I would uh, set my own terms and my own targets and deadlines. And I'll be glad to give you the name of that after. It's called the Brown New Deal. That doesn't what? sound helpful. That doesn't sound good, does it? No. <laughs> Brown. Sorry. Green. I like green better. It's more, it's prettier. It's fresh. Look, look out there. It's green. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Anita. How are you? Um, my question is about the quality of smoke. If you can talk about, because not all smoke is equal. No, not all smoke is equal. Um, that's also very complex. So there's people looking at if different vegetation burns, what is in the composition of the smoke? So at this stage, yes, the smoke all look different. Unfortunately, all type of wildfire smoke can cause smoke taint. And at this stage, we don't know enough to say really what those subtle differences are. So at this stage, we're saying all smoke have equal risk. There may be small differences, but they all can cause smoke taint. Got one here, and then you're next. Yeah, hey Jerry. Um, I love your fire and brimstone. It's awesome. It's really refreshing to actually hear people give climate change the attention it deserves. Um, but I'm also uh, curious. So you mentioned a handful of California's big climate policies, um, but you didn't mention uh, the role that really agriculture pays in. Um, plays in contributing to climate change and the fact that California has priced emissions from almost every sector except agriculture. Um, and so how do we actually start implementing meaningful policies that start taxing emissions from agriculture, which Well, luckily we have Karen Ross here who's charged with that very problem, um, our director of agriculture. Uh, first of all, we are doing, the state is doing something in the dairy industry and we put some cap and drain funds into biodigesters to reduce methane emissions, which is a uh, uh, super pollutant, as they call them. Uh, secondly, there are ways of, uh, of lowering the methane emissions from 
certain of my friendly animals that cover my ranch. Um, and that takes certain kinds of management. And then there's soil, uh, healthy soils, carbon capture for the soils, for vegetation, for forests. There is a lot to be gained. In fact, there's a lot going on. And I don't know, Karen, could you add any depth to my superficial answer? A couple of other things. First of all, in the inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture is 8% in the state, and the part of that is because of our efficiency. But we're also doing significant programs to replace dirty engines, diesel replacement programs, which is a significant player in this. The refrigerants, which are a meaningful part of the produce sector, as an example. Um, so there are a number of programs to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also agriculture and forestry are the two sectors that can actually do something to sequester carbon, and that's why our incentive programs are making a huge difference. Healthy soils, natural working landscapes, and conserving farmland, which will avoid greenhouse gas emissions and stop sprawl. So those are just a few examples of the things that are happening. Thanks, Governor. Right All right, here. thank just you. Right here. Uh, hi, Governor. I'd like to ask you your thoughts on H.R. 763, which is the proposed uh, carbon tax uh, and dividend where the, uh, the revenues collected would be returned to the public uh, on a monthly basis. Well, um, I haven't seen that's a local, I guess that's a state measure? No, it's federal. Oh, federal. Well, you know, we didn't, uh, California has a cap and trade program, uh, not a carbon tax. And the beauty of the cap and trade program is that the cap goes down. As the cap goes down, the people who can't meet it have to pay more. And the idea, of course, is to incentivize people to reduce and ultimately eliminate emissions. And also, uh, so the other thing about cap and trade, just among us girls here, um, <laughs> it's easier to get people to accept cap and trade than it is a tax. Just, that's just uh, the way it is. Also, I think cap and trade is targeted because it's a cap on emissions and then you pay if you exceed that cap. The carbon tax is a more general tax and if you really want to force change with a carbon tax, it's gonna be so high that the politicians uh, will do, they won't vote for it. it. It's just, it requires so much. And the cap and trade, I think, is a more uh, is a is a, a more targeted, uh, efficient, effective way to do things. Now it's a little complicated, and you have to create markets, and you have to make sure everything works right. But so far, California has demonstrated that a cap and trade system can work—a cap and trade market. In fact, we are thinking in California that the uh, cap and trade model, yeah, which we have, over the next 10 to 15 years will be over 30% of our emissions reduction will derive from that one uh, mechanism. So I think that's pretty good. And I would have to say that even that is hard because they had a cap and trade measure on the Washington ballot and it was beaten by about 13 points. So any, any of this stuff is hard. But in California, you know, we've already had uh, an income tax increase and then we had a gas tax. So you want to add another tax, uh, that would not be my strategy of how to proceed. I think we ought to take what we have and, and build on it. And I think then we're just doing an extension or expansion of what we have. And we have enough, uh, enough measures in place that we can expand them uh, if we're ready to finance them that we can get to, to where we have to go. Back there and then yes. up front. Yes, uh, uh, Governor Brown. I think really uh, the whole thing with cap and trade versus taxes is yep. really important. What I'd like to see is a big fat bill presented to the Republican National Committee as well as the re Republican uh, organizations for the cost of delaying climate change. How much is that going to cost us? It may not, maybe we won't pay taxes now, but it's going to increase the cost of our whole, uh, of, uh, there'll be a personal cost in terms of increased prices and that kind of stuff. Well, you're, you're right. When they talk about the cost of climate uh, action and actually meeting targets, like living within a growth 
of only 1.5 centigrade, it, you're talking trillions of dollars. But over time, and we're talking worldwide, if you don't do that, if you delay, you are talking about costs of even greater magnitude. And we don't even know uh, what nonlinear consequences will occur when, when, you know, as the oceans warm up, uh, what's that going to do about fish life? Uh, if the Arctic warms and the ships start going through the Arctic route, but then the methane starts uh, escaping from the tundra, and then you have methane, and then the methane heats up faster, and then the uh, forests, the uh, rainforests begin to uh, expire and diminish. So there's a lot of consequences, and it's very hard to put a number, but it's absolutely clear that doing nothing is, is catastrophic, and doing what we're doing is also catastrophic, except slightly more slow. That's all. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, 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 it's a, yeah. I, we don't understand the, 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 this uh, other party. I don't want to mention their name, but they all seem to believe things that aren't true. Uh, it's a very weird group there because they're normal. They know how to make a lot of money, but when it comes to uh, climate, they, they're a little bit slow. And hopefully, they're going to they're going to get it if uh, they start losing more elections, like they I, did in I, Orange I, County, by the way. I'd, I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see some university economists actually generate some, some price per capita that taxpayers could see. Hey, and this year, it's going to cost you this much, and next year, it's going to cost you this much, and get those numbers in front well, of the taxpayers. Yeah, we already have those numbers on fire, and it's not good. And certainly the people who died, that, you know, that's one horror and tragedy. So we, we, I think we have enough uh, consequence data in human life, in habitat destruction, uh, in dollars and cents, that that should be enough to motivate us. But there'll be more and more numbers. By the time we really nail it down, it'll be too late. So I think we have to act on the knowledge we have. Next question. Hi, Governor Brown. Um, as somebody who's young and will be living to see all these consequences of global climate change, I just wanted to say thank you for all your work and your advocacy. Um, I think you're definitely right in that younger generations see the urgency of it, um, but I've also seen the other side of individuals having this mentality of, oh, this one little thing I might do, you know, maybe I like use a reusable bag or I don't drive my car as much, like I'm just one person, it won't make a difference. What would be your response if you heard something like that and what would you say to encourage people to take more of an action on an individual level? Well, I would say this, that in order for the, the political leaders to make change and to make the changes needed, there's gonna to have to be a lot more change in the society itself. Because uh, the political person, uh, person, governor, senator, uh, congressperson, uh, they are looking at votes, they're looking at what their constituents want. And if the constituents are feeling happy enough with the climate degradation that's occurring, they're not gonna do what they need to do. So the fact that you change whether it's not buying a car or driving less or recycling or just your personal um, urging, your personal change and transformation, y you are helping. And if other people, yeah, if it's only you, no, we're done. But you and you and you, first by the thousands, the, the millions, the hundreds of millions, billions, that changes things. And yes, it takes the president, but it also takes ordinary people. The civil rights movement did not start with a senator or a president. The women's rights movement did not start. The gay rights movement, none of those, uh, the environmental movement did not start with political leaders. It started with other people changing uh, consciousness. That's why I say transformation is the key element. And I say that by not minimizing technology or investments or innovation, and I don't want to minimize what the president, because it's crucial, uh, governors, all the rest, but human beings can change the equation. How did it happen? How has the role of women changed in the last 50 years? It wasn't just by a bunch of elected people. Uh, the, ER, the Equal Rights Amendment never passed. It was people uh, joining together, consciousness raising groups, actions, 
And that built over time. Didn't build in a week, didn't build in a year, but over the last few decades, there's been a massive transformation of the role and respect for women uh, in this society. Same is true uh, of others. I mean, the other uh, groups and, and perspectives in our society. So you do have power uh, and you've got to exercise it and your enthusiasm will spread to other people because the people at the top, they're, they're listening and you are part of the message that they need to pick up. And so I think it's important that uh, all the students and the teachers uh, here at Davis and all the colleges, and then it's got to spread and to organizations, to churches, to unions, uh, to neighborhood groups. Uh, at some point, you reach uh, the critical mass, and you do have a rather minute part of that, but it's individuals uh, changing themselves, and that changes the group, and that makes it possible for the politicians to make the changes they can do. Next. Governor Brown, I just want to ask, what can be done to make the climate change issue less po polarized politically? I mean, you're, 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 you, can't, you almost answered my question, but I think there's more you could probably say. Well, the question is, why do 80, 90 percent of Republicans, or at least elected Republicans, not believe in climate change, or not believe it's a problem? How did that happen? Because among Republicans, you have pro-choice, you have different kinds of, there's a wide variety of diversity within that party. But climate change has become a litmus test. And I think one of the reasons is that people are afraid. I think I read a speech by the founder of the Cato Institute, a very libertarian think tank. And he said, environmentalism is a greater threat to our way of life than environmentalism. Environmentalism is the supreme threat. I think what he meant by that is unfettered uh, market activity cannot square with environmental restraint. So you have to have restraints. It's so like the Air Board. We say your car can only emit, uh, emit so much. A car company, you want to sell cars, you have to have a certain percentage of zero emission vehicles. That is the coercive power of the state limiting the freedom of business and people. But without that, uh, so that's, I think, their, their hang up. So as things get worse, as they get the heart attack, hopefully not too catastrophic, they'll wake up. That, I mean, they have to, because it's becoming more and more obvious. And their children are gonna be persuaded. They're getting older. The uh, climate deniers are dying. I don't, I don't say I'm happy about that, but <laughs> I don't think as many, I will make this assertion. There are more climate deniers dying. Uh, how shall I say? <laughs> uh, there's more climate action believers are being born uh, than there are. Well, you figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say is the, the, the turn is evident. The world changes. And uh, there is some science here. I mean, all that she did, she's talking about facts. And there's uncertainties, but there's facts, and every year you're going to get more facts. Well, that's happening about the climate story generally. We're learning more. Just the fire people. We didn't know we had a fire season almost the whole year round. But we have it now. And in Reading, they'd never seen this fire tornado, 140 miles an hour. Never heard of it before, at least in California. Well, now it happened. So how many strange, destructive, terrible things have to occur? But we've been, oh, I get it we better reduce carbon emissions. And so it's a race, uh, you know, do we destroy first or do we enlighten first? I, I'm hoping we, we win, uh, but it's an open question. I'm sorry to One report. in the back. Hi, yeah. Governor Brown, thanks for being here. My name is Julia Mitrich. I cover food and sustainability for Capital Public Radio. And um, I just have an observation from my last few years of interviewing uh, farmers and ranchers of all different scales. And sometimes when I'm talking to uh, folks who are stakeholders in the commercial agriculture system in California, it's a really different conversation than when I'm talking to uh, maybe smaller scale, scale farmers who are committed to sustainable organic farming. They're not at the same table. A lot of time they, they sound like they're talking apples and oranges. So when it comes to consciousness raising, 
what do you say to those in California agriculture who still aren't comfortable uh, coming out ahead and talking about climate change instead of, as Anita said, talking about in euphemisms like, quote, increasing incidences of drought and wildfires? Well, I think that uh, uh, growers in California are getting the message. When you say, so Karen, you're my expert in this field. Yes. Yes, see? Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, look, the, for whatever reason, the more conservative philosophy is, using, is seeing climate change as a liberal conspiracy and a threat to a, augment the power of government. Now, in truth, it is going to augment the power of government. So is population. So is technology. Progress, as it gives us the goodies, also requires more regulation in order to make things all work. That's just the way it is. You have to fill out more forms now. So I think, though, as people see the, the reality of what they're up against, I would imagine wine growers are more sensitive uh, on climate change than a number of other people. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we have a lot of farmers in Calusa County, and I only got 35% of the vote against Meg Whitman. So I don't say they're totally enlightened yet, but <laughs> I am making progress. So, uh, you know, it's a strange thing. The water, the underground, the uh, groundwater management, which passed and very vital to managing our water, all the people that represented rural California voted no. All the people who live in big cities voted yes. And yet it's something that was vital. So sometimes uh, we have to be dragged into this. But I believe that you're right that it's slow. It's slow in the Republican Party. It's slow in the Fortune 500. But not. It's. But there are changes. There's sprouts of awareness about climate and how what we we have to do something more. I mean, the Paris Agreement uh, was amazing uh, to get all the countries of the world to do it. Now we've got to realize it. So uh, you're just describing what is the problem. And the problem is a lot of people don't see it. It's more remote. Uh, but it will get worse. And the only question is, will people wake up as it get, gets worse so it doesn't get really horribly bad? So it's going to get worse. But if we can kind of get it at some point, we'll get the reversal in. I think what we're doing in California will be copied. Um, in fact, we have a China Climate Institute, and the California government actually works with Chinese officials, uh, particularly at the state level. So there's a diffusion of understanding. I think that will lead to more commitment, and whether it's agriculture or trucking or any other kind of shipping, uh, that's all, that has a lot of pollutants too. So uh, we'll get there, but we're not there yet, and you're uh, your experience there is, I think, very accurate of what we're up against. I think we're sadly going to have to close it here because we're a little bit over time already. And I know we could stay here all night and ask our wonderful speakers questions. But please join me now in thanking them. <laughs>